All right, uh, welcome uh, to the starting of the Tux 20th year's anniversary uh, event. Uh, we start with a distinguished lecture, which will be given by Professor Josef Sifakis. Uh, Josef Sifakis is well known for his work in, in verification and in model, state-based modeling of systems. Uh, and for particular for his, his work on model checking, uh, he was awarded the, the, the ACM Turing Award, which uh, we usually like to say that is the, uh, the, the Nobel Award of the ICT area. Uh, Professor uh, Farkis has also been very active, uh, not only in, in, in research in itself, but also in, in let's say, research management in terms of, of creating the very mag laboratory, which has been uh, very influential in a in lot of, of research in the embedded area, and also very active in the, both in the, in the, on the European level in organizing uh, embedded systems research through the artist network uh, and then later through Artemis. So I'm very happy to, to uh, give the floor now to Professor Sipakis here, who will talk about problems from systems. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> good afternoon. I'm uh, going to talk about the evolution, in fact, of uh, ICT, Information Communication Technologies. And I would like to start with this slide that shows the evolution of, of the area. And uh, you know that uh, computing is a very young discipline. Uh, the foundations have been set in uh, 36. And then you have a very rapid evolution. And I think that the uh, important keyword here is convergence. You have com com computers that are used everywhere. You have uh, uh, the first commercial applications in the 70s, and then you have a uh, convergence between computing and telecommunications is this opened the way ah sorry I'm, uh, is my mic on or okay. not yes. yes it's on yes sir. yes it's working very well okay good so and uh, this opened the way to to the web uh, and then you have the advent of uh, embedded systems here the convergence between computing and physical systems and there is another important landmark that is anticipated here. It's the Internet of Things. I'm going to talk about that. So today the situation is that you have embedded uh, uh, systems uh, in plenty of uh, uh, devices, uh, uh, appliances, uh, 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 more than a trillion of them deployed over the planet. And the dream is how to build the global services, how to combine all these services that are produced lo locally to provide global services. And this has uh, uh, influenced the vision of uh, uh, big companies, big software companies. Here you see the example of IBM. So IBM, they started five, five years ago a very ambitious program for a smarter planet. You can read. Uh, so the objective here is not to sell uh, uh, software or machines or hardware, it is to propose global solutions to all the problems of the planet. Uh, the systems now are instrumented, they are interconnected, and they, we want them intelligent because, and this is a very, very important characteristic, because uh, we want to be able to predict events and to uh, manage resources in an optimal manner, okay? And then you have other examples where uh, software companies are interested in mobile services. Uh, two years ago, three years ago, Google bought Motorola Mobility, and this is something you know very well here in Finland, and I think things are moving very fast because uh, uh, Google sold back Motorola Mobility to Lenovo uh, without the IPs. You see the difference here. Have, uh, they bought it uh, 12.5 billion, 
and they give it back to Lenovo for only three billion. And then you have Google that is interested in uh, thermostat and smoke detector makers. Okay, and this is uh, uh, also a remarkable fact. And then uh, to go back to Google, this is the Google Universe presented in an article of the Time magazine one year ago, September 14 last year. Uh, uh, probably you cannot read, see the details, but you can uh, perhaps see that the, okay, the service is part of Google, the web service is part, part of Google. Google is a very small part of this universe. We have uh, cars, we have, uh, uh, you have telephones, we have uh, health applications, uh, energy applications, and, uh, oh, sorry, I did uh, something wrong. And uh, this is the cover of the same ma issue of the Time magazine that shows that the, their ambition has no limit. Okay? And I could have continued like that for other companies. I think that the important vision here is what people call now the Internet of Things. Uh, you probably read about that. I will be brief. Uh, so the idea is that now all in all application areas you have computing systems, you have sensors, you have actuators. These are so applications that are instrumented. They can collect data, and they can send the data to the cloud. And in the cloud, you collect all huge amounts of data and you make some analysis, and you are able to make some decisions uh, uh, that are sent in the form of commands back to the, the devices. Uh, okay, so this is a very interesting vision because uh, uh, you, you, you have uh, intelligence everywhere. And this means that uh, it will be able, for instance, to uh, control uh, efficiently uh, the traffic, uh, to have uh, smart factories, uh, to have uh, smart cars, uh, smart buildings, smart grids, you have probably. Uh, many interesting health applications. The question, of course, is uh, whether this vision is, is reachable, and this is something I would like to discuss here, uh, because this technical vision hides or raises a lot of, of uh, scientific challenges I would like to discuss very quickly here. So, uh, what happened over the uh, 40 past years is uh, there is a shift of our interest from programs, from writing software to system development. So the difference is that here you have software that computes functions, so you transform an input into an output, and, and the software has these characteristics. I hope you understand this. And the difference between a program and the system is that the system is composed of hardware and software and controls the physical environment. So like the systems you have in lifts, you have in all appliances, all the embedded systems. 95% uh, of the chips that are produced are embedded today, okay? Are not in laptops or in servers, okay? So uh, here, the, in order to understand the behavior of this box, you have to formalize it in, in, as a relation between streams of input and output values. The behavior is non-terminating and is non-predictable. And I would like to say that we have no theory about how to build systems. We have a theory about how to build programs and software. We have no theory about how to build systems in particular we have no theory to predict the dynamic behavior of a software running on a particular platform. Okay, so this is a, a very important difference to understand. And uh, systems are hard to design, uh, not because they are handling, they may, may be handling com complex data and algorithms. This may be the case, but because also of unpredictable and sub interaction between the system and, and the environment. And uh, so here you see how systems can be used to control complex environments. And what matters is, uh, in particular, the speed of this uh, reaction. Okay? And this depends on the characteristics of, 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 of the hardware you have here. So uh, just to finish my introduction, 
I will say that over the past 10 years in particular, we have a shift of interest from programs to systems. And uh, uh, a trend that breaks with traditional computing systems engineering, systems engineering with, that deals with uh, laptops and servers. Uh, so this is uh, the focus now is on how to build uh, embedded systems that jointly meet the technical requirements. I give a list, the list could, could be longer. So uh, you need uh, guaranteed reactivity. For instance, your laptop may fail to execute a command within uh, some time bound. This is not acceptable for a flight controller. We have requirements for autonomy, dependability, scalability, etc. And as these systems appear in mass market products, you have also, in addition to that, economic requirements. When you design a mobile phone, you are seeking some economical optimum. Okay? You don't want to have the most, the best possible iPhone. Okay? And for this, you need theory. Sometimes it's harder to build a system that uh, uh, that meets some uh, optimality requirements than to build a system that is the best possible system. Okay. So we need theory for this and the technological challenge is how to design systems of guaranteed functionality and quality at acceptable cost. So this is an outline of my talk. I will talk about system design and explain why system design is different from hardware or software design. And then I will uh, discuss three scientific challenges that will be for a long time, will remain open, linking physicality and computation, constructivity, intelligence, and, and I will conclude. Okay, so this is... Uh, now, let's say a few words about what design is. Design is the process that leads from technical requirements, from requirements that express your, our desires, our needs, to an artifact. And this is a universal concept. You can apply it to uh, designing buildings or designing cars or even cooking, okay? I mean, if you, and, and design involves two main steps. One is the step where you formalize your requirements here, your designs. Then you have to give uh, a recipe. So here, a set of instructions that say how you will proceed. And the third step is that now you will choose the resources to implement the recipe, okay? So you can have, a, a, what is this? An apple pie. So you apply the same recipe, but you can take different quality of ingredients here, okay? And this is also true of systems, of course. Uh, you have uh, requirements, you write the application software, the implementation, and of course, an important concern is whether you get, finally, what you have uh, uh, desired, what, what, what you have required. And this is the issue of correctness I would like to discuss. So for systems, the concept of correctness differs from the concept of uh, software correctness or hardware correctness. And I am trying to explain this here. In fact, you need the two types of properties, trustworthiness requirements that express the fact that the design system will behave as, as expected. And despite of hardware failures, despite of design errors, of course, so you understand design error is different from a failure, okay? Because this is a logical, okay? and disturbances from the environment and, of course, malvolent action. So you see the security issues here. And, uh, of course, building systems that are trustworthy is, okay, is, is uh, an important objective, but not at any price, okay? So another concern of system developers is optimality, okay? Because you can have very trustworthy system at very high cost, and, and this may not be economically interesting. So, optimization requirements uh, are taking into account two criteria. One is performance, which say, roughly speaking, how the system behaves, how well the system behaves with respect to its users, okay? So, uh, what is the throughput, the jitter, the latency, for instance? And cost, okay? So, this is for users, and this uh, uh, system developers care about cost. 
And of course, the important thing is to find trade-offs between the two. Okay. Now, just to understand that trustworthiness and, and uh, optimality requirements are, are very different by their nature. So trustworthiness, oh, this is the set of the system states. I can say that the state is non-transworthy or it is transworthy green or red. And uh, for optimization requirements, the optimization requirements characterize execution sequences, okay? So uh, trustworthiness is kind of qualitative correctness, okay? And of course, one important problem is uh, 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 that when you design a system, these two types of requirements may be conflicting. You can, uh, for instance, have a system that is uh, make a transworthy system that uh, by, by using a redundancy techniques, this will cost more money. Uh, and so the question is how you find trade-offs between optimality and uh, transworthiness. So today the situation is the following in system development. We have, uh, 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 we develop what we call critical systems that may be safety critical or security critical systems and you may have what people call best effort systems. So systems that are designed with the primary criterion here is how to optimize the use of resources and uh, maintain the system availability uh, uh, above some, uh, some acceptance uh, threshold. And then you have uh, intermediate situations. So these are uh, low complexity or medium complexity systems. Their development costs a lot. Here, for instance, for an aircraft, the reliability targeted is uh, 10 to the minus 9 failures per hour. And here the reliability may be of the order of 10 to the minus 4 and here <coughs> 10 to the minus 6. Okay. Uh, don't ask me how these are evaluated. Uh, but the important fact is that when you try, for instance, to uh, multiply by 10 the reliability of a mission critical system, you will have to pay much, much more in, 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 in costs. And uh, this, is, this is a problem. Uh, we don't know how to build systems that are critical, complex systems at reasonable cost. So this is something I'm going to explain. So today the situation is that whenever we use systems uh, uh, that uh, control autonomous processes, we have a lot of problems. Uh, here you see some reported failures for different application uh, areas. Many problems in medical devices, for instance, okay, in aircraft and, and, and uh, um, uh, cars. Uh, many vulnerabilities in banking applications. In fact, we don't know how much money banks are losing because of, because of attacks. And, um, and this is a, a, a slide I find uh, very interesting because, okay, it's, uh, uh, it's provided by DARPA. DARPA is the agency that funds military applications in, in, in uh, military research in, in, in the US. And uh, this slide shows the evolution of costs for high confidence systems. Here this is for, for uh, an uh, aerospace platform. So the, the, the complexity is measured in exponents of 10. Uh, okay, exponents of 10 of lines of code. And here we have uh, the, in logarithmic scale, the effort uh, in design, integration, and testing. So you see that for uh, uh, integrated circuits, we have kept the the costs constant despite the exponential increase of the complexity, while here we have an exponential increase of costs. And uh, this is the re and the reason is that you have mixed hardware and software systems. And uh, this is uh, another diagram that shows that if 
this trend is confirmed uh, in order to develop an aircraft unit, the cost needed will be equal to the defense budget of the U.S., and this is going to happen around the year 2070. Okay, so you understand that this is a, 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 a reason of concern for people who are building complex, high-confidence systems. Now, let's talk about the scientific challenges. Okay, so three challenges. One is how to relate the physical world and computation. And this is really a huge challenge that, that is a central challenge for computing, I believe, and it, that will remain open for, 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 for decades. Okay, so what is a system? A system, you run some software, and you have a hardware platform, uh, and the system interacts with some environment. So then from the environment, you have some requirements here, but also you have some constraints from the platform, okay, uh, regarding okay, all the resources that are available. So a good system engineer should, of course, understand and uh, be a good programmer, but this is not enough. He has to understand how the software interacts with hardware and the resources, okay? And then, of course, he has to uh, understand a lot about control, okay? How the system will be interacting with the environment. And uh, to summarize, a system designer should understand all this, and we need theory that cohere coherently integrates all this. So my idea is that Computing should be enriched with paradigms that come from electrical engineering, control theory, or, or physical systems theories. Okay, and, and we need this, and this is something I'm going to, to, to explain now. Now, uh, let's uh, uh, start, let's attempt a comparison between computing and physics. Okay? So, because physics and computing deal with the phenomena, and physical systems and com com computing systems also can are dynamical systems. So there should be some ground of comparison for this. Uh, so, of course, physical phenomena can be understood uh, 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 through the study of laws. Okay, we have laws for conservation of energy, motion, etc. But also, we can consider physical processes as computational processes, and uh, here I would like to say that uh, there is this interesting idea of computational thinking. So the idea is that you consider that uh, everything, okay, so a physical phenomenon, a physical process has some Okay, can be explained as a computational process. For instance, if I, uh, I throw a stone, it will describe a parabola. And I can say, well, this is a physical computer, it computes a parabola. Okay? And, and so you understand that you can, we can have this dual view of a physical phenomena, the laws, and the computational aspects okay, that characterize the, the dynamics of, of this. And, uh, but I, I believe that there are make, uh, some differences that I will try to explain. So, first of all, well, physics deals with phenomena of real world. Uh, and, of course, I'm talking about classical physics here. It's based on continuous mathematics. Uh, and uh, something very important about classical physics is that you have predictability. And all the classical engineering disciplines are, are using these theories. If I am, say, a civil engineer, I have the theory that allows constructivity of bridges, for instance. I know how to build a bridge that will not collapse with a very high probability for centuries. Okay? While for computing, I don't have such theory. I have some fragments of theory here, but I don't have the predictability and the constructivity I have. And also, computing is based, is rooted in, in, in discrete mathematics and logic. 
And of course the question is how to, 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 to relate these two domains of knowledge. And let me try at least to show some dif differences concretely. So both computing and physics deal with systems of this form, x prime, function of x, y. So for computing systems, x prime is the next state, x is the current state, y is the current uh, input. And in physics, OK, so this x prime now will become some, some, some derivative of x. And of course, here the variables are, are, are functions of time. Uh, now, if I consider a simpler program here, uh, and uh, let's consider a very simple electromechanic, uh, uh, simple mechanical system. So I have a mass with uh, uh, okay. uh, this. Uh, this is the, 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 the behavior described by uh, using differential equation. This is the law. This is the energy conservation law. And you see that this is the behavior part here. This is the equivalent of this. And for this program, you have a law that is what is we call the loop invariant here. That is the GCD of x, y is equal to the GCD of the initial values of x and y. So you see the similarity here. Now, the difference is that physical systems are inherently synchronous and they are driven by uniform law. While here the law is defined by the programmer and here you, do, you have no notion of time. So in software, in programs, all the basic models in, in, of computing, you don't have a notion of time. So this is a basic difference between, between physical systems and, and, and computing systems. And uh, OK, let me skip this just to show you uh, how this impacts uh, uh, pr standard practice in uh, systems engineering today. So systems engineers today uh, use models that come from physical systems engineering, like, like this. This is a very popular model, MATLAB Simulink, where you engineers draw these diagrams, block diagrams. The blocks are, uh, okay, are, are uh, systems characterized by their transfer function. This is uh, as can be described as a system of uh, uh, linear differential equations, and this is an ABS system, in fact, so you can, the engineer draws this and can generate code uh, for an ABS controller. Now, uh, it's important to understand that here you have uh, signals, you have flows of events that are time, and, and these are, these transform timed flows, okay? Uh, and at the same time, the engineers uh, use uh, uh, tools like this. So this is uh, uh, a UML model of, of some controller. So when the engineer is programming here, he reasons sequentially, starts from a state, some event occurs, and you go to another state. Okay. So and these, these two worlds are completely different. And uh, the physical world is inherently parallel. It's timed, it's synchronous. And this is asynchronous and untimed. And uh, there are other difficulties. In, in when we describe physical systems, uh, we are using, typically, for instance, this. Uh, we're using mathematics, continuous mathematics. So, uh, and MATLAB simulating, for instance, can have a unit delays. A unit delay is a, a function that is mathematically very simple. But if you try to explain computationally what does a, a unit delay, this this is not a this is not simple. Okay, just to show you how you can model a unit delay by using automata. This is uh, this is uh, one automaton that behaves as the unit delay. Okay, let me try to explain this. What does a unit delay? It receives an input signal and delays by one time unit the same the same input signal. Okay, here I'm considering that the inputs and outputs are boolean. Now, uh, this automaton is has transitions that are triggered by the 
arising and falling edges of, of the input and, and the output, and I have a timer here that, 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 that controls these transitions. This model is correct only if the distance between two consecutive input changes is less than one time unit. If in one time unit you have many changes, then you have to record all these changes and then you may need an unbounded number of states to model, to model this. So you see that what is mathematically simple is not necessarily computationally simple. And this is another problem in, in, the, tra in, in the relationship between the two models. Okay, I think I, I, I should stop here uh, with my comparison just to say a few words about now the uh, research we are doing to uh, relate computational systems and, and physical systems. Uh, here I would like to talk about uh, a new research area in computing that is called also hybrid systems. So what are hybrid systems? Hybrid systems are systems that have components that are hybrid, that uh, are characterized, that have uh, uh, the components have some uh, uh, machine for computation and we know also the electromechanical characteristics of the components. So just to give you an idea about the possible applications of, this, of these systems, you've probably heard about uh, 3D printing. So 3D printing, the idea is that you can, you can edit, you have a, a software, you can uh, 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 build a model, a geometric model of an object, for instance, a cup or a bot, and then you send this model to a printer, and the printer builds the object, the physical object. Okay, so this is a very simple idea that can be extended, or people are trying to extend in the following manner: there are sophisticated CAD tools, computer-aided design tools, now to, for instance, to uh, design engines. And here you can give, for instance, the dimensions of a piston and all the physical characteristics of the piston. So not only the, the geometrical characteristics, but the physical characteristics, thermal resistance, etc. And also you can say that here I have microcontrollers or whatever that control, uh, make some computation. So you build a virtual model of your engine and you have a software to do that that composes all, all the okay, hybrid components of the system and you run your engine and then you send this model to some factory that will build, will build the, 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 the engine. Okay? Or here you have uh, modeling tools, for instance, for modern wings of aircraft or, or you can build. So this is a very interesting idea that will become a reality if we have the theory to integrate, I mean, to build systems <laughs> that are intelligent, so have computation, computing elements, and, and uh, this idea is explained in this slide here. So you want to build a system that is complex, here it's a vehicle, and you know out of components of which you know the cyber characteristics, so what they can compute, how they are intelligent, electromagnetic, thermal, fluidic, electrical, etc. You integrate all this and you have a model of your vehicle here. And then once you have the model, you can evaluate it and send it to a factory to be produced. And these are extremely interesting ideas that will not become a reality unless we have theories about how to build, uh, uh, to build these models out of components that are hybrid. Okay, now let me talk about components a bit, constructivity, because this is something that is missing also in, in, um, from computing. So you understand how important it is to use components in uh, any engineering discipline because all engineers use build uh, artifacts from usually from a limited number of types of components if i am an electrical engineer i will build electrical circuits out of uh, three different types of components okay now uh, for computing systems we don't have 
uh, a theory about how to build systems out of components, or we don't agree on what are important types of components. We have this for hardware uh, engineering, but not for mixed software and, 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 and hardware systems engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, so today systems developers are facing this, this problem. I call this the babel of languages. They are using hardware description languages, uh, uh, system description languages, um, middleware, uh, okay, concurrent, okay, programming languages, uh, okay, a big variety of languages, and these languages uh, cannot be related semantically, okay, cannot, when I am an engineer, a systems engineer today, I may use some language to model my system, to evaluate my ideas, and then I validate my ideas, and uh, I forget the model, and uh, just program uh, uh, my software or my system in, in plain C, okay? So uh, what we need is, is some, uh, some integration, some coherency, uh, to make the, the design flows more coherent, and, uh, okay, the, today the components we are using are heterogeneous. You may have synchronous and asynchronous components. You may have different mechanisms for interaction between components, different programming styles. For instance, you can, you have thread-based programming or actor-based programming. Uh, so you have this heterogeneity and there is no agreement on, on how to combine components. But even if we have a common notion of, of component, what we need in addition to that is, uh, is uh, uh, rules for, for achieving uh, correctness. And here I'm presenting my personal, uh, my personal view about how uh, this can be done. I am working on uh, uh, how to guarantee uh, system correctness by construction. So let me try to explain this. Assume that I have components, so these are bricks, and I know that they enjoy, they have very good properties, and uh, this is stamped, this is uh, correct. I would like to have theory to compose healthy components to build, say, a, a wall that is healthy, okay? So to know the rules, which rules will, will guarantee this, and uh, this type of results are, 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 we don't have this type of results for very simple properties today, like uh, deadlock freedom, for instance, for systems, okay. And uh, so we need the theory for that. And uh, this is not enough. We need another type of rule, and this is a, a, a composability rule. So let me try to explain the idea uh, of composability. So, Assume that I have rules for building a wall out of healthy bricks. Okay, so I know how to do that. I should have guarantees that, for instance, my wall is not too high. So if I bring a new component, it will not jeopardize essential properties of the integrated components. And this is a phenomenon that appears very often in systems. I have a system that works perfectly well, and I bring a new feature that is, has been tested separately, and this jeopardizes the behavior of the whole. And these are phenomena that uh, are, are known as uh, feature interference phenomena in, in, in operating systems, in middleware, in telecommunication systems, in uh, web services, okay? So I need the theory. This is a problem that systems engineers are facing every day. I know how to solve a problem, another problem, how I combine the solutions without, inter without interference. This, this is an open question. Okay, now let me finish by talking about intelligence. So this is the hardest, uh, uh, I mean, this is the most important challenge and uh, how does to explain. Okay, so one interesting question is how artificial 
and natural intelligence are, are related. Okay. And, and here, just some superficial remarks. Okay. So, living organs combine physical processes and computational processes. So there is computation in, in uh, physical organs, and now biologists understand this and, and the study, study some, some bio, bio phenomena as computational phenomena. So that, that's good. And uh, the living organs and, and computers share some characteristics, use of memory. I think also there is some similarity and distinction between hard hardware and system and brain and mind, they use languages. And uh, there are also some important differences, and this is a, a very important one, the robustness of computation in, in bio systems. Now, I think it's important to uh, encourage stimulate the interaction between uh, computing and, and the neuro uh, biosciences and here you see some, some possible interactions. Now, the question is what it means for a system to be intelligent. Uh, and uh, for me, intelligence is the ability to create knowledge by applying rules of reasoning. So uh, these uh, three different types of rules of reasoning, in particular induction, I'm going to explain this. So for me, uh, intelligence is not this, so using supercomputers to uh, 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 explore uh, complex spaces, okay, or to solve combinatorially hard problems. Uh, so this is not intelligence for me. It's just, I mean, okay, using supercomputers to, to, to solve uh, Okay, it's, it's clear that computers can compute faster than, than, than human brains. Okay, so that's, that's the difference. So, uh, uh, here now I'm, uh, uh, I would like to explain this, uh, which in my opinion is very important that in order to understand uh, how intelligent can be computers. Uh, in fact, uh, a well-known fact is that uh, some very simple properties of programs are non decided For instance, you cannot decide that uh, if a program, you have no algorithm to decide whether a program terminates or whether a program variable is bound. So this means in practice that programs are not able to find induction hypothesis. So in order to prove, for instance, partial correctness of a program, you need to find what we call an invariant, a, a predicate that holds at the initial state, and such that if it holds at some state, then it will hold in all subsequent states. Okay, so this is an induction hypothesis, and clearly programs cannot find induction hypothesis. Because if they could find induction hypothesis, then, then they can, I mean, they can solve undecidable, they can decide undecidable problems. Now, I think that, and this is just a conjecture, that living organs can do more than computers. But I leave this for, for, for the discussion. I can, I can provide more, more evidence about that. So uh, what computers can do is to, OK, we have uh, an idea about what computing is, and computers just implement this idea, and the implementation can be done by using uh, uh, relays, uh, tubes, uh, uh, transistors, any such <coughs> device, okay? But I think that uh, in uh, the natural world there are some computation models that are robust, parallel, what I explained, and are not subject to the limitations of these systems. And this is, uh, of course, an open problem. Uh, my conjecture is that 
the models of computation we have can model only what we call uh, okay or what Kahneman calls uh, uh, slow thinking. So uh, there is an interesting book by Daniel Kahneman who is a, a Nobel Prize of, in economics uh, thinking fast and slow and here he explains that our mind combines two types of thinking, fast and slow thinking. So fast thinking is the type of thinking you are doing when I ask you how to solve a problem. How, for instance, what do you do to go from here to your back home? Okay. So I'll do this and this and this. So you are thinking slowly and sequentially. Okay. And fast thinking is the type of thinking you are doing when you are talking, when you are walking, or when you are playing the piano, for instance. When you are playing the piano, you don't analyze what you are doing. In the piano, he tries to analyze what he's doing, he will do something wrong. Okay? So this is fast thinking, and fast thinking follows another type of, of, of computational model. Okay, so this is a conjecture. Now, just to say something more useful about uh, intelligence, I think the concept of intelligence that is useful in systems engineering is, uh, is uh, the concept of uh, adaptivity. So what's the basic idea behind ad ad adaptivity? The systems, we cannot build systems that are flawless. So in principle, I can build a system and, and uh, okay, you can eliminate uh, hazards, but there will be some hazards that remain and here the idea is to have an adaptive controller, so this is something magic, that monitors the system's state and uh, is intelligent enough to, uh, <coughs> to cope with uh, all these problems by steering some parameters. So the system is designed so as to be controlled and you can, you can uh, uh, say, prevent the effect prevent catastrophes, okay, uh, the catastrophic effects of some failures, for instance. So that's the basic idea. And, uh, okay, so how I can design such, such controllers and why I, uh, adaptivity is important, I, I think I'll try to explain a bit, uh, or not, okay, perhaps. Okay, let me say a few words about how an adaptive controller works. So an adaptive controller works, these are ideas that come from control theory that can be, uh, uh, can be uh, uh, formulated in a context of, of, of computers and control by using computers. So the idea is that an adaptive controller works as our mind works. So our mind combines three functions, in fact. Management of objectives, this is a central function. Uh, planning and learning. So this here in the management of objectives has a model of the external world. So you have a model of the external world and some criteria for choosing objectives. So at some state of my mind, for instance, I may wish to do this or this or this. Okay, And uh, I have, by using the management of objectives, I may decide to take one of these three choices, for instance, to go to the stadium, and in that case, you activate the planning function, so you do that, and once you do that, you evaluate, okay, uh, uh, a posteriori, so what you've done, and you, in doing that, you learn something, and this allows you to modify some parameters that you have in this model, okay? And the next time, perhaps, you will make a different choice, okay? So the idea is to use these intelligent controllers, and there are, today, adaptive controllers are used in many areas, in data mining, in multimedia systems, in networks, okay? But we have no general theory about how to build this. And I think another problem is that... Uh, if you have a very sophisticated controller, the overhead you will have, the computational overhead you will have, 
uh, may not compensate the gain in control you have. And this is also a problem for, say, the Internet of Things. For the Internet of Things, they say that the intelligence will uh, be provided by the cloud, okay? But the cloud is far from the points you want to control, and how much time will need the cloud to make an intelligent decision and, and control in real time uh, processes? This is, a, this is an open question. Okay, so now uh, some time for discussion. So what I have tried to explain is systems are becoming important and we need theory for designing systems that are trustworthy and optimal. Now, uh, coming from a community that has worked on verification, formal methods, I've always believed that we should strive to build systems that, that are correct. Okay? And today, uh, okay, what happens is that in many areas, in particular, uh, I think uh, uh, in, in, uh, when we build uh, large systems like, like uh, web-based systems, uh, we don't take this rigorous approach. We don't take this rigorous approach. And you have, say, a, 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 a branch of computing that becomes an experimental science. You've probably heard about big data analytics and things like that, or people talk about web science. So the idea is that, well, now uh, the Internet... Okay, the cyber world is a reality. Let's study, as the physicists study the universe, okay, let's study the cyber world and do some experiments and try to improve things experimentally. Okay, and I found this, uh, this citation in a book. Online companies don't anguish over how to design their websites. Instead, they conduct control experiments by showing different versions to different groups of users until they have iterated to an optimal solution. Okay, so and I think that these these are behaviors that okay people now are uh, we have this euphoria of uh, e-commerce uh, web-based systems, but I don't think that uh, these experimental approaches will uh, solve will allow us uh, uh, solving the problems I have mentioned. So these are good for optimization purposes, but uh, uh, if we want to have, say, trustworthy systems, okay, to our systems to meet qualitative properties, this cannot be achieved by tuning of parameters. It's clear. Now, so today we don't have theory for building systems, and the question is why this is hard or how hard it is. And here I would like to make a comparison and take some analogy. Okay, you know that in any discipline to understand the reality we study, we have to use abstraction of hierarchy. So this is the most famous is this one that we are using in physics. You are observing the reality at different levels of, of detail and you have theories, and of course the problem is how to combine all this. Physicists talk about the theory of everything, okay, a theory that will explain in a unified manner the physical phenomenon. So I think that we have a similar problem. Uh, you study, you can study a, a computing system at that level of detail. Well, so here you have a system of differential equations, okay, at logical uh, gate level, or, or you can try to climb up the hierarchy, and, and this is a problem. Of course, this is you have a similar problem in, 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 in biosciences. Okay, so uh, another important idea uh, I have tried to explain is that design is uh, a human activity that is uh, uh, really uh, 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 it is is is. Uh, I mean, deserves scientific study, and I would like to position here design with respect to science. So, I, here this is the world we observe, the physical world, the living world, and the human-built world all day. 
the artifacts we have. So what does science? Science observes the phenomena and uh, here you have ideas plus data. Some of them become information and they, some of the information can be formalized as knowledge. And what does a designer, what does an engineer, and computer scientists are mainly engineers and designers, who use knowledge to build artifacts, to build computers, but also smart artifacts, as, as I have explained. So, so this is uh, something that is becoming important uh, in, in computing, but in other disciplines also. So for me, what is important is to be able to design systems, uh, systems that are computing systems, but also hybrid systems. And uh, there are two important issues. One is the, what I call the language issue. How to be able to translate the requirements into uh, uh, programs. And, uh, okay, so I think that because usually requirements are of declarative style, requirements are just properties, so can be formalized by using logics. And I think that programming should evolve to encompass, okay, some declarative style. And this is, uh, this is an open problem. We can discuss about that. And of course, constructivity. We need a theory that guarantees that we allows us to guarantee that our systems, the systems we build are correct, which is not possible today. And uh, for this, I believe that an important concept is the concept of architecture, but I'm not going to give details about that. So just to conclude, I think that we should strive to provide system design with some uh, basis, uh, uh, scientific basis to formalize it as a process that engineers also can understand and provide the tools that allow this. And of course, I hope that uh, we it will be able to achieve this because otherwise this means that all the nice dreams we have, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the Internet of Things will not be uh, achieved because we will be hitting what I call the, the integration wall it will not be able to, we will not be able to integrate services and to have, say, autonomous uh, control systems uh, uh, as, as, as it is anticipated. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so the question is whether the Turing test is a good criterion for deciding. Okay, for me it's not. Because, I mean, it's, it's very simple. I mean, it's just, just super, a superficial criterion, okay? Because, in my opinion, all the, the intelligence under codes that show the computers is the intelligence of their programmers, nothing more, okay? And, uh, uh, I mean, a computer cannot create information because to create information you need inductive reasoning. And I've tried to show that uh, computers, I mean, if computers can create induction hypothesis, then you can decide and decide that problem. So for me, there is... Uh, uh, really a barrier between uh, the intelligence of computers and, and the rest, okay? I mean, computers will never, can ne will never compete human intelligence, and human intelligence is based on some different computational models, in my opinion. 
Okay, I was not provocative enough. I need more questions. Okay. What do you mean? Can you be more specific? Um, what do you mean by change? Um, change in, in the environment, change in, in uh, uh, the, uh, the circumstances of something, change in the okay. of okay. people. So what's the relationship of this changing to computers to, to systems? Because I mean that systems are open systems. Yes, of course, yes. I'm talking about open systems that interact with environments, yes. Yeah, and the environment changes all the time. The environment changes and the problem of the system is how to uh, uh, respect some laws or to preserve some properties despite the changing environment. Okay. okay. So changing is a bad thing. Changing, I would not say bad or good is, is I mean, has some, uh, some, okay, I would say that, that this is, uh, this is life. You have to deal with changing environments. Okay. So you have to deal with changing environments or non-predictable, because the change may be predictable or non-predictable, okay. So if it's predictable, no problem. If the change is unpredictable, and this, this is a source of problems, and uh, I had a slide, but I did not show, so there are two sources of non-predictability. One source is, uh, perhaps I should show this, Yes. Okay, so uh, do we have yes. So you have uncertainty that comes from the external environment, mm -hmm. in particular for instance for security, how to uh, figure out what are all the possible attacks of an intruder or a hacker, okay? So this is this is a source of uncertainty. And then you have uncertainty also that comes from uh, hard, from the the execution platform, because, uh, for instance, in some uh, in some applications, uh, or in most applications, we want to have security or safety guarantees. We need to know upper bounds of execution times, and uh, 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 hardware platforms as they are designed uh, today, they. Uh, okay, the, the, we have uncertainties in the execution times. Okay, and this is explained by this diagram. So if I am an engineer and, and I want to estimate execution times for simple statements on a machine, because, okay, today you have uh, architectures that are very sophisticated, you have uh, pipelines, you have caches, and things like that, the execution time can vary, and it can vary between some bounds. So you have a distribution of execution times. Now, if I am an engineer, I need to estimate for this, but for reasons it would be long to explain, I cannot compute exact estimates of this, and I can compute only upper bounds. And this is a problem in systems engineering because these upper bounds can be, uh, in some cases, can be uh, okay much larger than the real bounds, and and this this uh, 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 so if today in in many applications we would like to know for safety or security reasons uh, uh, when. And an instruction and statement will be executed, some precise bounds. Now, if these bounds are too high, this means that I will spend in a lot of resources. And, and something I did not have time to explain is that you have 
uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, these two schools, critical systems engineering and best effort engineering, and in critical systems engineering, you are based on worst case analysis, and this makes critical systems cost a lot, a lot of money and a lot of resources. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. The real world is, of course, quantum mechanical. Classical mechanics is only a fine average of our... You say the real world is quantum mechanical. Yes. Let me disagree. I am an engineer. No, I mean, do you see any quantum mechanical thing here? Yes. No. If, if I am a control engineer, I don't see this. Sorry. No, 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 yes, but, but I'm using, I mean, o most of the engineering is based on classical physics, okay? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me come to my question. Yes, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> Since the world is called mechanical, <laughs> 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 you're presently looking at classical mechanics yes. in connection with computation. Yes. Do you see as a future endeavor for mankind to look at the same questions, but not against Okay, okay. So, first of all, I, I don't understand so much of quantum mechanics, so I will not take the risk to say anything uh, deep about that. But, uh, okay. So, first of all, what, uh, what I would like to see is a connection between computing and classical physics. Okay, first of all. And, and this would be a great achievement. Now, uh, I think that computing has some, some similarities with quantum mechanics. Uh, I mean, we have the same type of difficulties, okay, because, for instance, of the discreteness of, of the phenomena we have in computing, for instance, in quantum mechanics. And also another problem we have uh, in, in uh, computing, and we have similar types of problems in quantum mechanics, is... Uh, a problem with modularity. So all the success of classical physics is due to the fact that you have a, a concept of component that is modular and you can understand the world as the composition of components. And, and this so idea of modularity relies on a simple assumption that I have building blocks I know how to characterize their behavior, and when I compose them, I can, this behavior does not change. This is not true, for instance, of biological systems, and probably is not true if this principle is not applicable to quantum phenomena, okay? So, I don't know whether I answered your question, but for the moment, my ambition is uh, how to relate computing and, and classical physics. And this is already a, a, a big challenge. Uh, yes? Just another question. So, uh, so the problem here is that uh, the present markets don't really favor high, high quality software. Yes. And, uh, and uh, in, in similar situations in society, uh, government is coming up with putting requirements. So yes. Bridge Can be yes. The yes. My question is, of course, that do you see that assuming that the government would understand what we're talking about, would, they, would it be possible that uh, they could somehow took up some requirements, which, uh, for example, guarantee requirements or something like for software, <coughs> enforce my quality? Okay. That's a very good question. Thank you for the question because I, I, I wanted to talk about that and I forgot. Uh, okay, so that's a problem with uh, the systems today, okay? Because, and, and this is a problem with um, software systems or mixed systems. Uh, when I buy, say, a car or a fridge or a washing machine, I don't buy a critical car, okay? I don't buy, a, I mean, it's, there are standards about that. And, and for computing systems, there are no standards. So this is the, the 
it's, it's unique in the history of, of I mean, uh, the modern civilization, okay? You buy something and you have no guarantees, okay? Without guarantees. So I think that there is clearly a responsibility of governments here, okay? I mean, there are political issues that have, have not been adequately addressed, okay? So this is one thing, clear. The second thing is, the problem is that we've built all the existing infrastructure from s in some ad hoc manner. So you had some ad hoc developments and we, it's <coughs> very hard now to say that we will guarantee security uh, uh, in the internet or whatever. I mean, that sounds like a joke, okay? You cannot guarantee the security of something, of an artifact, or a property of an artifact, you don't even understand how it is built, okay? So when I discuss with the people who designed the operating system of this, okay? So the guys who developed this, okay? They, there are some situations they don't understand how the system behaves, okay? So I have worked with uh, aircraft industry, okay? Airbus for years. And here the approach we have taken is completely different in the sense that we, you have strict rules about how to write your software, okay? You have, I mean, the target is not full correctness, but at least is equantability. So you are, you write the software and you can explain why do you put this and this and this. Of course, a software costs a thousand times more than ordinary software, but then you have the guarantees, okay? So, uh, today the situation is, is uh, I mean, is not reversible. I mean, you cannot say now that you will legiferate and, okay. But at least I think that we should have some, I mean, the, the, the governments or worldwide would, would make, <coughs> establish some rules. For instance, it's better to know the source code of a software, okay, than not to know the source code. Because if you can inspect the source code, okay, you can understand something about what it does, okay? So there can be some rules established and also some restrictions. And I think that, and I was saying that we will be hitting a, a, a wall, I think that as now, because the dream of all these system developers and the big companies is to integrate services. The question is up to what extent they will be able to integrate services and to have uh, loops without humans. And here, personally I, believe that, personally, I believe that there is a limit to that. And I know a lot of projects that could not and will not become a reality just because no certification authority will put a signature on this project, on these on these products, okay? Very simple ideas, okay, that, that would work otherwise. For instance, I know uh, one one type of projects I know that are very hard to to, 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 to become a reality, to be applied is just to have a, a, a remote medical assistant. So just a case at home for all people or people who have some chronic disease, instead of being in the hospital, you are at home, you have a, 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 a pressure meter, you have some, some devices, you measure this, you send to the hospital, and the, 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 the medical doctor will prescribe some medicine, etc. Okay? So this, this is a, uh, these are projects of... of uh, I mean, if they, they, they become a reality, this will, uh, would uh, make uh, huge economies for social insurance systems, okay? And they cannot become a reality just because we have safety, security problems, uh, identification problems, whatever, and also some, some problems with the regulations, in fact. Uh, and I know a, a lot of other projects that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, cannot, cannot, Become become a reality just just because we will not have the degree of safety or security we need. Now, uh, you know also that they are talking about a new generation uh, internet. Okay, you have uh, projects uh, for uh, an internet to establish an internet that is what they call the industrial internet of things, 
where you have a, uh, that meets the responsiveness requirements. Okay, responsiveness uh, is, is our time predictability, something very important. We will see. But for the moment, I think this is, uh, this is uh, an issue that is not considered seriously by decision makers. Okay. Osmo. Uh, I think uh, Goodstyle has suggested uh, <coughs> the idea of uh, singularity by what he means that uh, mm -hmm. after computers or computer networks uh, uh, have achieved uh, consciousness, um, after that uh, there is a kind of uh, uh, event horizon after which uh, mankind cannot anymore control what happens? What do you think about that? How does it mean cannot anymore control? I mean, so what are the dangers that for, for uh, humankind, uh, I, I cannot say. I mean, what I, I, can, I can comment on what I see today. What I see today is that you have in fact, a whole technostructure that is established and the important decisions are taken by a minority of people okay, who decide about it, how all this is organized. Uh, but, okay, that's, that's all I can say. Also, what is striking for me is that uh, now people okay, in the, uh, all this uh, social media game, okay? So people, there is some uh, uh, tacit contract between the user and all these providers of services. So the user accepts to give a part of his privacy or to use some software with no guarantees just because it is uh, free, okay? And uh, these are these are very interesting phenomena, soci sociologically speaking. Okay, but uh, what will be, how will be the future? I don't know. Other okay. questions? I think uh, we want to once more thank you for a very interesting talk, and we're very glad that you could come and visit us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.